Hey, Will. Hi, Michael. Thanks for being here on the live stream. It's it's great to have you here. Thank you. Good to be here. Yeah. Thanks for everyone for being on the live stream, uh, on the live chat. I see a bunch of familiar and friendly faces. And if you've got some comments for Will or me, please put them into the chat. And I'll try to make it part of the show. If you're watching afterwards, yeah, maybe not so much. But thank you for watching. All right. Will, you ready to kick this off? Sure. Let's do it. Will, welcome to Talk Python to me. Thank you. Uh, it's fantastic to finally have you on the show. I feel like we've talked a lot of, about the work that you've been doing many times, not so much on Talk Python because we're more focused on a single topic. But even so, I believe, you know, at the end, I always ask for some project that needs attention, needs some sort of shout out. And, you know, I believe Rich has come up more than once. I think Textual has come up <laughs> at least once there. So yeah. uh, the, the prior guests of the show have been fans and I know the audience is, is a big fan. So, yeah. Congrats mm -hmm. on all the progress there. Great, thanks. Yeah, it's, um, really appreciate the coverage. Uh, you probably increased my star count by a few thousand. <laughs> well, I, I do want to talk about that because this project is super popular. And as we get into it, I think it's going to be fun to you know, explore some of the things that you felt were key to that. And mm. if, if, if this is the first time people are hearing about Rich, you definitely want to check out some of the screenshots. Maybe I'll do something fun like make part of the show, have the the show notes or the the podcast player have some screenshots from uh, the various sections. Like as as there, I'll see if I can make that happen. Mm. But before we get to all that, before we dive into rich and textual and all the other things, well, let's talk about you. How do you get into okay. programming and and how do you find yourself doing all this open source Python? Um, how to get into programming? Oh, okay, so um. As a, as a kid in the 80s, I guess, I had a, a Spectrum 48K computer. Um, it was a little plastic thing you plugged into your TV, and you could create um, very simple animations and, and uh, little games. And I think, I think from there I was hooked. It's just Fantastic. something about me that connected with, um, with programming, I guess. Um, What's interesting is those games were so basic, right? They weren't like yeah. 3D, VR, oh my gosh, no. I'm there, or some of the flashy even the flashy uh, mobile apps, uh, mobile games these days. But something about those early, early games really captured the imagination, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the fact that they were so limiting um, had to make you a little bit uh, cre creative. Yeah. So encouraged creativity because um, you couldn't do much of anything. So you had to make the best of what you got. So it encouraged you to, to experiment. Uh, I think it was a great way to get people um, into programming again. I think... Uh, yeah. Until until recently, we haven't had that. And I think the Raspberry Pi does that to some extent, which is a great thing. Yeah, it sort of reaches out into the real world in a more simplistic way, kind of uh, repeating that cycle, right? Yeah, yeah. And it just allows people access to, to programming in a, in a very kind of um, accessible form for, for children, I guess. Yeah. So I think, I think the next generation in 20 years uh, will be citing Raspberry Pi is how they got into programming. Interesting. Yeah, I built yeah. I built a robot the first time around or something like that, right? Yeah. Instead yeah. of instead of <clears throat> wanting to play a game or script a game out or something like that. Mm. Interesting. And you know, a lot of times I ask people, okay, well, what are you doing now? They're like, oh, I'm, you know, head of data science at company such and such. You you've taken a, a very uh, interesting, and I suspect a lot of people will be quite uh, jealous uh, of what you're up to these days, right? You, you, what are you doing now? Yeah, um, so up until recently, I was contracting. Um, but I end, ended my contract, and I'm going to take uh, a year out. Um, well, poss possibly a year, depends how much, it depends, depends how things go. Um, but the idea is to, to work on open source, uh, specifically uh, rich and, and textual. And uh, other projects that take my fancy as well, anything that I can contribute to, um, I will might try my hand at it. Um, it's not entirely selfless because I do think there might be commercial applications uh, for textual down the line, mm -hmm. um, but certainly for this first six months, it'll be just focusing on just making it the best. best making it um, super, super solid foundation. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, I don't think it. I don't think it's going to take that much to to get some things in place to make this long term for you. You know, people can go if, if their company or individually they're finding huge value, they could go to GitHub and sponsor you. 
there's enterprise stuff that, that can be set up. We'll, we'll dive a little bit into that more mm. possibly later as well. But, you know, I, I wish you a lot of luck, but I think with the, the traction that you're getting and the new things like I, I really find GitHub's sponsor feature to be something of a game changer, right? I mean, yeah. I remember looking back, you would see, oh, here's a popular project. Maybe it's not even an open source library, but it's like an app. And it's like, click here to thank the developer on PayPal, right? And just... Okay, there was maybe a little bit of a, a barrier to, to, to entry. Yeah, and maybe yeah. you do it yeah. once, right? But but with mm. GitHub, you can say, I, I just kind of want to say, I want this to keep going. So here's here's $2 a month. And if, you know, not that many people who find it valuable send in a couple of bucks a month, all of a sudden it starts to be a foundation that you can really build from. Yeah, it, it could... Um build up and be something which is sustainable and sustain open source because so many people benefit from open source including big big companies big corporations yeah. um but a lot of these developers are, are doing it um in their spare time for the love of it and they they haven't um asked for funding before but a lot of them that deserve funding so yeah. there's lots of projects which um could, could really use funding to, to make sure they keep going, to make sure that the software that we all use um, is still available in, in a year, in two years, and five years down yeah. the line. Yeah, otherwise we're going to end up in a place with like open SSL, where there's yeah. one person who maintains it and a quarter of the world seems to be built directly upon it, right? Remember that bug? Yeah, it was it was a huge problem. Heartbleed, was it called? Which is it? Mm? Heartbleed? Yeah, Heartbleed, that's right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Which is a great yeah. name for a bug. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. It's like, well, wh why wasn't this fixed? Well, there's one person who does it in their spare mm. time, but everything depends on it. Yeah, but there's still one person who does it in their spare time. Yeah. And yeah, yeah it's just really hard to put that kind of energy and responsiveness into it. Mm. All right. Fantastic. So let's talk. Let's start with not textual, which I had on the screen, but let's start with Rich. Rich mm. is where things got started amongst rich and textual right if i remember the history yeah rich was was first that's about two years ago that i started that yeah yeah cool so tell people you know a lot of people have heard of rich mm. um, but maybe tell folks out there how like, how would you describe it you know it's we've had ways to sort of print stuff nicer we've got pretty print in python mm -hmm. we've got colorama where you can put color into your your terminal but this takes yeah. it to an absolutely new level so tell us <laughs> tell us about rich yeah um that makes it difficult to describe sometimes when people ask me what it does because it does um quite a lot of things um but it's all under the umbrella of, of writing um uh, more sophisticated output to the terminal so at, at, the, at the basic level, it's you can set colors and you can set styles like bold and italic. Um, next level up, it'll do word wrap and it'll also word wrap the uh, the styles so you can apply bold and then then word wrap it. Uh, and then we have things like uh, tables. Um, there's quite sophisticated table support which are quite close to HTML tables. You can you know um, yeah. put things in cells. You've got a um, header row, you've got a little divider, and then you've got the data. Yeah. It, yeah. And, and you can draw and, lines around it and change the styles. And um, it's, it's yeah, all. Um, you even have like alternating rows, right? So it kind of helps you yeah, line it yeah. across, which is pretty neat. Ex exactly. Yeah. So it, it's, it's quite um, sophisticated. Um, and it's all, it's all composable. So if I've got a table, um, I can obviously put text inside it, but I can put um, another table inside it, or I could put a progress bar inside it. Or syntax highlighting inside it. So the idea is that um, uh, rather than like uh, lots of separate libraries which don't work well together, uh, which I think was the situation that we had previously, um, now they all work together. They fit inside each other and they integrate quite well. Right. So you could take your formatting and put it in your word wrap and put it inside of a table cell or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So one of the things that struck me. Well, there's a couple things. Um, but one of them is just how popular Rich is, right? It's almost 30,000 GitHub stars. That's mm. that's close to fast API level of popularity and, and not that far behind Flask and Django. That's mm. that's really, really popular. When did you create this? Um, Two years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I guess on the timeline, similar age to fast API, but much 
younger than Flask and Django, uh, if I'm comparing them to those. And over here, it says on your page, you have 2 million downloads a month. That's pretty incredible. Yeah, that's 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 pretty crazy. I think um, quite a few of those are automated they're from CI systems. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I do see that that rising quite quite steadily. Yeah, I wonder how many of the CI systems just in general out there uh, do caching uh, at, at some mm. level where it wouldn't register, right? You know, if I pip install a thing I've already installed and it's a certain version, I'll just say using cached version, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Versus if you create a brand new Docker image and then the next thing you do is install your, you know, pip install your dependencies inside mm -hmm. of your Docker container. That's a, that's a true download, right? Because that machine is totally fresh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't know. What, what do you do? You have any feel for what that breakdown is? Um, to be honest, I'm not sure. Um, that that site doesn't give you the the breakdown. Uh, to be honest, what I would be interested in is is how many developers typed pip install rich. Um, yeah. In, in that that month, you know, how many human beings uh, played with it? That would be, interest me more. Um, but suffice to say, quite a lot of people have used it. It is and, quite a lot. Yeah. 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 yeah, I'm sure it's changed the way that you think about working on the library and whatnot, right? You know, it's mm. uh, maybe that this <clears throat> might might destabilize, this might cause a problem, or this might cause yeah. confusion. It's one thing to do that for a thousand people; it's another to do that for two million, <laughs> you know, or That's something. Right. Like that, right? It's I am. Um, you're going to hear about follow, it a bit. I, absolutely, I, I didn't follow Semver very strictly original originally. I always planned to use uh, Semver and. People were starting to use it, and I made I made a breaking change. And I didn't think anyone was using this particular feature, um, so I didn't increase the the major version number. And then um, a couple of days later, I I got an issue. Someone telling me off, uh, quite rightly so, oh, man. Um, for for not warning them about a breaking feature. So since then, I've been very very strict. Um, it's at version ten, um, and that's because um, I've made ten changes breaking changes to the api they're actually quite small you know it might, might just be one signature in, in in one method but that requires a, a major version change right but at that scale obviously that's still yeah. affected enough people you're going to hear about it and, and whatnot right exactly I, I don't want to break anyone's code i don't want to give them a bad day so um, i'm Absolutely. very strict about that kind of thing yeah yeah fantastic mm -hmm. and also people should pin their versions right Hmm. So, on, the, on the flip side they, they can also make sure that what they're working on is is nice and stable right yeah a lot of people don't um i, I do search github sometimes for rich and i look at their um pi their pi tumble was it is that pi yeah. project yeah. Tumble mm -hmm. and project and tumble, yeah. yeah and and a lot of people don't pin pin their rich fresh number it'll just be rich and yeah um, it shouldn't break too much and and often it's a hobby project, so it's it's not not the biggest deal, um, right? It really it really depends. Like it's one of the things I struggle with. Uh, so I do a lot of course development, right? Yeah. And I don't necessarily want to pen people to the oldest version. I'd I'd rather let them have the newest stuff, so it exactly matches the documentation. If they go check it mm -hmm. these days and stuff, if they go back, you know, six months and watch the video or mm -hmm. check out the demo app. But at the same time, there's a chance of that instability. There's always this tension, right? And I guess it depends mm -hmm. on what the use case of of that app or that library is. Yeah, yes, yeah. so it's, it's tricky to say. You, the, the, more, the less um, critical it is for your business um, or your project, the more you can relax. If it's a tutorial, maybe yeah. it doesn't matter quite so much, but if it's um, critical infrastructure, right. uh, then do you want to pin? <laughs> Yeah. So, um, yeah, for my web apps, versions are pinned, super strict. Mm -hmm. Even the dependencies of the dependencies, like the transitive closure of the dependencies are all pinned. But on, yeah. on like little demo apps and stuff, like it's just wide open. So I, I think it it, uh, it depends. All right. So uh, out in the audience, we have Hybotic says, Will, this looks really good to me. I'm looking at your repo now. So not everyone has previously heard of Rich, which is awesome. Mm. <laughs> Oh, it's good to know there's a few a few people left. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I I suspect there's actually a lot of people so uh, who haven't heard it before. Again, check out uh, the the screenshots because if you think, oh, here's something that sort of enhances terminal output, 
that completely undersells the the level of what you've pulled off here. And that's only before we even talk about textual, right? Mm. Yeah. So uh, let's let's talk about compatibility because one of the things I find with these sort of nicer terminal output things is like this works fantastic on POSIX systems. Oh, but you better not be on Windows or uh, if you're a data scientist, you like Jupyter Notebooks, you can forget about it. But if you really want to run this thing, like, so what's the story? Like, where can I use this? Um, just about everywhere. Um, Linux, OS X, Windows and Jupyter. Um, it was started out, it was Linux, OS X, because that is the easiest platform to develop this kind of stuff for. Hmm. Um, Windows is a bit of a black sheep. Um, it didn't quite work windows is getting better though right i mean when it was cmd.exe it was Mm -hmm. like this is really different but the new windows terminal uh, i'm really digging it you know Mm -hmm. the the new powershell the things like oh my posh extensions i can feel much more at home on windows on the terminal than i used to yeah yeah so the the new windows terminal is is much better um rich doesn't have to do quite so many um doesn't have to jump so many hoops to to get windows support in fact um it just runs kind of as is. Um, it still supports the older Windows terminal, <clears throat> which does have a few issues. Um, it doesn't, it has very That's limited brave. colors. Yeah. Well, I guess um, maybe you want to, right? If, if you're going to give the app to somebody, you can't really package up the terminal they're going to run it in. So you probably want to have your right. best possible experience on, to be honest, most people are still going to be running cmd.exe, even if they shouldn't. Yeah. It, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I could just tell them to install Windows Terminal, um, but that kind of goes against the ethos. Of this library, I just want it to work so that people don't have to think about what it runs on. Yeah. Um, absolutely. So yeah. So uh, yeah. Linux, Mac OS, and Windows with good support for the new Windows Terminal. Very mm-hmm. limited support for the old command prompt. That's still pretty good. That's still pretty I think, good. I think it's fantastic, actually. I mean. Mm. If people are really passionate about their terminal and they're on Windows, they probably know about Windows Terminal anyway, so they're probably good. That's true. Yeah. The one that yeah. I thought was interesting and, and nice is uh, Jupyter Notebooks. Mm. So what's the support there? Um, so it works quite quite well. Um, so I, I wasn't a big Jupyter user um, at the time. I was obviously uh, aware of it, but didn't use it myself. And and people asked me for Jupyter support, and I thought, it doesn't do that, it just works in the terminal. But then I looked into it, and I, it wasn't too bad, because I already had functionality to export terminal content to HTML. Mm-hmm. Um, so I could put a little wrapper around that, um, export it to HTML, and then insert it into uh, Jupyter, that they've got an API, which allows you to uh, write content into a notebook. And nice. so I got, I got Jupyter support up um, quite quickly quite easily and it, it works quite nicely, um, which people appreciate. It means that you can write code um, which writes to the terminal mostly, um, but if you do happen to run it in a Jupyter Notebook, um, then it'll it'll write, write the it's same just, thing there as well. It just knows, it det- detects that it's running in the Jupyter yeah. environment and then it just, yeah. all right, output is not print, output is generate HTML. Exactly, yeah. And Jupyter does has, have support for that. It will capture standard output and it will um, convert the colors and everything, um, but the problem is it 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 um, wrapped the the lines. So if you expanded the window, it would break any kind of neat formatting. If you've got like a a grid or a table, it would break that. So I had to I had to do the HTML export within Rich as well. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. that's super neat. So basically, most anywhere people do Python with a UI of some sort. This this works mm. is the takeaway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just going back to the pip uh, pin inversion stuff. Uh, Wayland on the live stream says pip compile. Uh, pip tools is a game changer for pin dependencies and pip compile specifically for managing pin de- uh, dependencies. That's what I've switched to as well. So mm-hmm. I just run a script, checks for all the new versions, regenerates all the pip compiled stuff, and it's I'm really enjoying that. I think that's fantastic. Okay, I've not all used right. pip compile to uh, check that. It's, out. it's yeah, yeah. It's so you basically define. Um, uh, like a requirements file that has what you actually have would have pip typed pip install and then it will generate a requirements.txt that is the transitive closure of all of those dependencies which are pimped, pinned and then you can ask any time for it to update the versions the pinned versions of that okay is that like um poetry's lock files is that 
uh, it's, I think it's similar. Yeah. Mm. I'm not hundred percent sure, but I think so. Mm. All right. So let's talk about, uh, various features here. I think just going through, I mean, we've touched on them, but let's, let's dive into it a little bit maybe talk a little bit about the code you write. Sure. So Kim Van Wyck is here to kick us off on the first one. Uh, try something as simple as drum rich import print in your next project and you will be amazed. <laughs> so, Will, tell us why we'll be amazed. Like, what, what's this alternate print? Mm. Okay, so um, when I first wrote this as a, as a console class, you have to construct a class and that's got a, a print method. Um, but I figured um, I could just um, overwrite the existing, the built in print because it's a, it's a function in Python 3, I can just replace it with my own version. Um, so that's what I've done here. I'll give, um, there's a, a version of print you can import from Rich, which has the same signature um, as a built-in print, um, but it supports the console markup, so you can insert these little square brackets um, with, a, with a style like, here we've got bold magenta, and it'll do um, emojis. you got Colon and these uh, styles, like the square bracket, bold magenta, mm. slash bold magenta, this is specific to Rich. This is something that you came up with? Yeah, that's right. Okay. It's, it's called, um, I call it console markup. And the syntax is very BB code-like. I don't know if you ever used yeah. BB code. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's quite simple. It's just like a, a markup where the, the tags have I, square brackets. Yeah, I like this a lot because one of the things that I'll use a lot still is, um, which maybe I need to start switching to what you're doing here, is Colorama. But for mm -hmm. Colorama, you'll, you'll do things like you'll import the foreground settings or styles, and then you can say foreground.green mm -hmm. plus the text, then yeah. foreground reset to go back to normal. But you don't have the bold and then, um, all of that stuff has to happen in code, right? If I wanted to say import some text and then show it on the screen, that text could have these styles in it, right? That's right, yeah. So you can um, embed it in code easier or read it from a file, um, et cetera. And I, th I think it's a bit easier to read rather than doing lots of um, string concatenations. Yeah. Um, and also the benefit over the Colorama approach. It, Colorama is a very good bit of software. Um, I've relied on it for years. Uh, but the problem is, when you concatenate strings like that, you insert these ANSI codes. Yeah. And then when, once you've built that string, you can't do anything with it really. Um, you can't word wrap it, you can't format it. Um, so so with, with console markup, you, you can do, you can mark up bits of text with color and style, et cetera. And then you can further do um, operations on them like, like uh, word wrap and centering text and putting it inside a table, et cetera. All right. Two other things that jump out here that are interesting is you have emoji support. So mm -hmm. you can say colon vampire colon, which is pretty yeah. awesome. You can, yeah. I mean, you can technically, if the file format supports it, you could actually put a, a vampire emoji in the string, but it's yeah. still kind of nice that you have this um, sort of emoji lookup, right? Yeah, exactly. Because, um, if, if you want to insert the, the Unicode character, you'd have to go and find it and then cut and paste it. Yeah, um, exactly. But this way you can just do colon. You can set that into console markup, just colon vampire colon or colon smiley colon. Um, there's, there's a, I think there's a couple of thousand emojis you can use there now. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Then another thing that jumps out is you're printing hello, bold magenta world. So that's the word world, bold and magenta, <laughs> and then the vampire. But then you're also printing out a dictionary and yeah. the dictionary is like pretty printed, but also syntax highlighted. That's right, yeah. Um, so if you print a container, like, like a dictionary, a list, or, or like an atomic Python type, it'll run the pretty printer over it. So it will format it um, in kind of the style that people like. Um, in code, you probably format. This is how black uh, would format it, so it looks much the same. And then it runs um, mm -hmm. syntax highlighting over it. Um, There's a few regular expressions. So in, in rich, you can say anything between two quotes is is a string, and therefore it's green. Um, anything in, in angular brackets is a, is a tag-like thing. So I'll I'll bold the brackets and change nice. the tag name to um, bright red or whatever it is. And, and so that the output you get um, is quite readable and looks like something that came out of VS Code or, or your editor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
the more I look at this, the more I think maybe just every project I'm going to follow uh, Kim's advice and just from rich import print because you know why not right this looks mm. it has all this cool auto formatting and does it does it look actually at the type that it's printing to make any determination or does it just look and see if it's source code and then try to format it? Um, it looks like, the, like if, it's, if it gets a dictionary or it gets an object mm. versus getting like a true string. Um, it, it'll, it'll do both. It'll syntax highlight a, a, a string, um, but if if it's a container, if it knows that the type, um, it'll do some syntax highlighting there. Um, there's also a, a simple protocol you can add um, to your own objects if you want them pretty printed and formatted. Oh, okay, um, but not Dunder Stir or Dunder Repper. That's something um, else. It's like, it's rich. Like um, it is um, <laughs> Dunder Rich Repper. Um, Right on. That, you can specify um, the the base, the arguments and parameters and uh, the the indentation, and it'll render something that's that's very much like a pretty printed uh, dict. That sounds like something that would be fantastic to add to some intermediate library that people use. So I sure I could create a class and add it to mine. But so often, what I want to do is print out a Mongo Engine model or a SQL Alchemy model or a Pydantic model. Yeah, Pydantic could add that, or you know, what I mean, like these, like or SQL Alchemy could add something mm -hmm. like that. And go, oh, this is how you, you know, describe. Like this one has an index and and whatnot. Mm -hmm. I think that'd be fantastic. yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so I've I've added to to Atters, so it'll pretty print um objects from the Atters library, and I have a, a PR for Pydan Pydantic as well. So Pydan, yeah. in the future, um, you print a Pydantic object and it'll format it um quite similar to the the built in data structures. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Um, I love it. So before we move on to this, I do want to talk about some other things because there's that's we're just scratching the surface here. But one of the things that I think has both impressed me and you know Brian and I over on Python Bytes on our podcast we do there, we've we've been continuously impressed at how fast you're adding new features <laughs> and still kind of keeping the the ethos of this library together. Uh, so how maybe give people a little hint on just the velocity here. Like how's that work? Well, I'm I'm not convinced that um it's been that fast. I mean, bear in mind, Rich is. It felt like a lot of work. It didn't feel that fast. <laughs> it, it it does, but um, thing is, uh, when I add new stuff to Rich, um, I'm not starting from scratch. Mm. Um, there's several layers which are um already built and well tested. Um, so the the bit that I add um might not be as large as it maybe it looks. I see. Um, so you've already got a lot of um structure and architecture that makes adding a new feature not yeah. from scratch sort of thing right so a good design basically uh i hope so yeah and it seems to be working quite well because um you know i did build a core feature set and then i added some things to it and, and admittedly those things came quite fast because it wasn't that hard to to sure. implement and i've yeah. got to a point now where rich is um it's it's quite large um i'd be resistant to adding um, any more stuff to it unless it is very useful for like a, a broad selection of users. Sure. So I think do you have a sense of how many lines of code it is? I know you don't mean large in that sense. You mean large in sort of feature set, but do you have a yeah. sense of how many lines of code? Uh, you know what? I've never checked. <laughs> um, I, I Maybe by guess. the time we're done with this uh, recording, someone out in the audience will have like already downloaded and checked for us. Who knows? All oh, right. Yeah. So the next thing let's talk about is. Uh, the the REPL. Mm. So I can create a REPL or read eval print loop by typing the word Python on the terminal. And that opens it up. But it's it looks just, you know, it's like one of it's probably the least possibly good experiences you can have in Python, right? There's there's like no color, there's no in there's no feedback on sort of what's happening, right? But mm. then I could say from rich import pretty, pretty dot install, and then all of a sudden, basically, the output of the the REPL, like if I set a variable name, it will print it out. Like that becomes rich printed, right? Mm -hmm. Tell us about That's this. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, you, you call pretty dot install, uh, and then everything you put into the after the prompt uh, will be pretty printed. Um, so previously, if you printed a, a dict without rich, it will just um. Sh smush it onto a few lines. It's, it's quite hard to 
Right. It's, it's all one line except for the word wrapping, which doesn't even break on words. And there's zero yeah. color, right? So yeah, exactly. So it's it's quite difficult to read. Um, I'm quite a visual person, so I always had difficulty with this. If it was more than two lines, um, it would be quite difficult for me to figure out um, where the keys and the values are. Um, but if you do it with Rich, it'll pretty print it onto lines and it'll indent it. Uh, like you would code and then it'll highlight it so it makes things just much more readable yeah. um a lot of people will put it in their startup file so they just get this ripple by default oh interesting yeah that's a good idea um have you tried this on the more advanced um ripples like pt python or bt python or those um, where you can get an emaxi or vim experience mm -hmm. I haven't, no, I've tried it on iPython and it works quite nicely on, on iPython, but I haven't tried it on other. Yeah, it probably works on PT Python, but I haven't, I haven't tried it. Um, mm. Cool. All right. Now, another thing that you can do a lot with is uh, you sort of taking it up to the next level is the console. Tell us about this. Yeah. So the um, console class um, gives you more kind of um, advanced features. Uh, there's, there's more options, more things to specify. Uh, typically, you'd have uh, a single console per project. Um, you could keep it in your like um, top-level object or or as a global, and it has um, a print method. And there's also some other methods like um, and there's there's a log method, and there's a whole bunch of features you can do when you construct the the console. Things like um, uh, exporting the output to HTML. Okay, um, nice. nice. Yep. That's fantastic. Yeah, so one of the things you can do with the console, for example, is you can set a style on, you say, console.print and set some styles, mm -hmm. and then it'll come out in that style as opposed to embedding this console markup into the text itself, right? Yeah, yeah. So you can decide them. Um, so sometimes you might not want the console markup, especially if there's um, uh, going to be square brackets in the output. You don't want right. them to or, or even if um, you're receiving a string and you just need to put it on the screen, but you don't yeah. control, you haven't generated the string or it, it was generated by some other part of the app, right? Like, here's a message. I need to log this that I got. You don't want to exactly. like parse the string to try to put text into it or more text, right? Yeah, exactly. So you can um, disable the highlighting and you, know, you can still set a, a style globally for, for that string if you want it in red or, mm. or cyan, whatever. You can still get that, but but you can disable the uh, console markup. Um, yeah, for it. nice. Hmm. And then we have the inspect, rich inspect. What is this one? So this is, this is my favorite function um, in rich. And it, it came uh, quite late. Um, but what it does is you call it with any object and it'll inspect that object and it'll pull out doc strings and it'll pull out methods and then it'll render it in a in quite a nice little little table that, that's quite easy to read and i find this terrific for um exploring apis sometimes it's better than documentation you, you know if you get an object back from an api you don't quite know what methods it supports you just right call is it, it so i could have i could have typed something like dir my you know print dir yeah. my my object and i get a a list of dictionary objects which mm. are representing you know fields and methods and whatnot but they're exactly. all jammed together there's no like help this is this is fantastic so it's like a almost a table version of that with a, a, a one line of help next yeah. to it right yeah so it, it does the same kind of thing um mm. as dir or, or way help. way nicer yeah it makes it there's easier. also two things i see there's a block of stuff that has um it's like a list of, I guess those are field names, and then it has the methods mm -hmm. it's sort of called out separately as well. So you're like, these are the fields or properties, and or these are the fields, and then here's the probably methods and properties, right? That's right, yeah. So it, it basically shows you the, the signature of um, all the methods and the first line um, of the doc string. Um, there's, there's an option to show you the, the full details, but I, I find just that abbreviated information is generally as much as I need. Oh, this is fantastic. So it says 
things like copy equals def copy bracket bracket would it say async def if it was an async method or what's the or what what um, is that what's the alternative of def there is it just to show it's a method that's just to show it's a method um that's a good point about async i don't think it does do um async def and it'd be, that's a good it'd be idea dope to throw in a async def or maybe a property if it's a, a mm. getter method right or something like you're that. right yeah i think yeah. it probably should do that it should inspect the method and see whether it's um async and then and then emphasize that yeah it's a good idea yeah, yeah sure i'll open a pr on that podcast here no problem cool. <laughs> all right so those are ones that you've got like graphics calling them out as <clears> some <throat> of the really main things and there's so much happening here that's that's amazing but uh, like Waylon out in the live stream points out, like mention rich tracebacks. Mm. <laughs> They're so good. Um, I have um, my iPython automatically start up with that. Mm. And yeah, you've got uh, a whole section down here under the library of things like logging, log handlers, progress bars, status, tree views, like crazy. You have, you have tree views in the terminal that can expand and collapse with the mouse. You know, there's there's more going on here than just the stuff we've touched on, right? There's a bunch of cool features. There's a lot going on, yeah. Um, well, um, Rich will render the tree view. Um, it's textual, which provides the um, collapsing and uh, got, it, got it, got it, got it. Okay. Yeah. So we'll, we'll get to the the interactive bits, but yeah. So I can still draw a tree view even with like little. Uh, your example here, you've got emoji icons for say folders and files, and then even in the file, you've got an embedded syntax highlighted bit of code that comes out of one of the files. And a markdown with yeah. some of the markdown rendered as rich markdown. Yeah. Just as so markdown, it, like not, not rich yeah. the library, but like just colorized mm -hmm. and formatted. Yeah. So it goes back to the um composability of rich the rich um objects. Um I call them renderables. Um, but you can use them in, in various contexts. So in, in here, um you can set a renderable per node on the tree. So you can like do what we've done here, add a add a table next mm -hmm. to a tree item. Um, or some syntax highlighting or, or or render some markdown. Um, it doesn't really matter to to Rich what you ask it to render. It can just do it in various yeah. contexts. That's super cool. Very cool. Okay, so we've got the tree, which is amazing. Uh, let's, you know, since Waylon mentioned, let's talk tree <coughs> backs real quick. I mean, what I, I one of the things that really is tricky with the trace backs is, you know, you a lot of times you've got to go to, um, to like one end of them to see sort of the error. And then like, there's no color. There's, there's no, like, there's just a lot of stuff dropping in there. Mm -hmm. you, maybe sometimes it'll show the variable values, but you know, not really you got to kind of pull them out. Right. Things like that. And mm -hmm. what you get here is, is ridiculous. First of all, what do I do? What do I have to do to make this happen with the beautiful trace backs? Um, you could do from rich import trace back, uh, trace back to install. And, and then, and then all good. Yeah, from then on, if you don't if you don't handle an exception, it'll be printed uh, with rich, or, or you can. Uh, it's the second thing I gotta just put on all my apps. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a piece of cake to add. So um, yeah, it's easy to do. Yeah. So and, tell me what people who are, are not seeing this necessarily on the screen, like what is this this alternative traceback style look like here? Okay, so it's um it actually follows much the same format as a regular Python. Traceback is just underneath the, the file, um, you'll see some syntax highlighted code um, showing you that the line where the, the exception happened for each frame. And underneath each um, block of code, it'll show you the, the locals at that point in the frame so you can see the local variables. And right, these are called out in a nice table with a nice formatting that we've already talked about. So kind of as if you had done print you know, from Rich import print and then printed out the locals into a table yeah and it's all it's all pretty printed so it's quite easy to to read um i find with regular python tracebacks is it it takes quite a bit of skill to read them yeah um particularly for beginners and even for intermediates um you've got to sit down and analyze the tracebacks but i'm hoping with this this just kind of presents the information uh, in a more readable way and you can like um get more of the context of the error yeah, I think this is fantastic. This definitely is super interesting. I guess one more thing here to really dive into, uh, maybe two, two. I think the log handler is, is really neat, so people should check that out. But uh, maybe tables. I know it's mm. it doesn't sound as like appealing and amazing as necessarily as what we've been talking about, but if I want to have a nice formatted table in a text output, 
I basically just don't do that. I'm like, yeah, that's that's just that is way too much work <laughs> yeah. to worry yeah. about this, right? But with using Rich here, you can have fint- almost HTML level formatting styles, you know, borders on, border off, just header, uh, content divider, like alternating rows, like I said, uh, right align, left align. There's all sorts of amazing stuff <laughs> here. Tell us about the tables. Um, yeah, so um, I didn't realize how hard tables would be to implement when I started it, or I might not have, <laughs> <laughs> might not um, have done it. Huh? <laughs> t- tables are quite complicated because um, you've got to um, calculate out optimal column widths, and that gets really complicated when you've got text which can can wrap, um, and other like renderables that can go in those cells. Um, but it does work yeah. quite nicely now, and it can handle just about anything you can throw at it, and it will um, scale the table nicely and elegantly if if it doesn't fit into the uh, the you know the width of the terminal. And it's also quite a good layout tool. You can switch the borders off entirely and then use it to lay out other things. Um, much so of the one thing that comes with- to mind right away is I think of um, some of the nice progress bar type things for the terminal, like TQDM mm-hmm. and stuff. And they're great, but I'm always like the stuff on the right, it'll, it'll have like what it's doing and then it'll have a progress bar and then it'll have maybe, you know, how fast is it operating or how much time has it got to go or something. And those are always kind of like doing like a little pulsing, like, cause the thing on the right is always changing and they don't never quite yeah. line up. You could just you could do that here, but have a table and put the progress bar in one of the center fill bits, right? Yeah, so you can do lots of things um, regarding a, a alignment to, to to fit everything together, uh, and, and mm-hmm. like you said, stop that effect where um, bits of content will, will will flicker because they um, you know they're using less characters because it goes from one hundred and then to ninety nine, and then yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. So it's, yeah, it's it's a very good um, layout tool and also just a good way of presenting tabular information which is kind of what it was designed for yeah it is a table right (laughs) (laughs) all right so uh last one i've got some content and probably a most common way that it's in um like a lightweight format but you want to turn it into something um full featured in terms of text is markdown right so Mm -hmm. for example the python bytes website is almost like entire like the vast majority of the content there is markdown talk python training like all the stuff Mm -hmm. we've got the cms we built in the back end it's all markdown rich has markdown support too right um that's right yeah there's a markdown class um basically i took um common mark library which um parses the markdown okay and i substituted the um the bits which were generating html with something which generates rich output and it turns out there's a there's a reasonable job um of things like headers and uh, does the style just fine and there's also syntax highlighting it'll actually call out to the syntax highlighting code so if you've yeah. got um, a python code block it'll actually highlight that python code block yeah you have support for inline code with the backtick thing backtick and then yeah. the, the blocks of code which are the triple backslash or triple backticks or the yeah. four spaces or whatever. Yeah. So it supports um, much of the basic common mark uh, syntax and mm-hmm. does a reasonable job of rendering. It won't look quite as good um, as a web browser, but it, it, I find it quite readable. But it's in the terminal, and I didn't it's have to do terminal. anything to get it there, right? So yeah. that's pretty fantastic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Really, really nice. All right. So I think this is probably... As much of the the details of which we want to dive into in terms of like the feature set and stuff, but you know, there's still more to go. Uh, there's a lot of a lot to love out of this library, which is great. Maybe just give us a sense of the internals, like how how did you make this happen? How do you make it work? Is this curses to the nth degree, or what what's happening? Um, no, so there's there's no there's no curses. Um, th- there's a layer um, which what makes most of it work where. Um, I render everything into, and that's a, a list of what I call segments. And a segment consists of a bit of text um, plus a style. And the thing about having that intermediate layer before you actually render to the terminal is you can uh, manipulate a bit, manipulate it afterwards. So I can apply color and style, and then do do um, word wrapping, and then I can render it onto the, the terminal. Mm-hmm. So everything is is built on that, and and. Uh, and a, and a protocol, so objects can add a couple of methods. They can add a, a dunder rich or a dunder uh, 
rich console method and that then they can themselves be renderable so you can print your own custom objects and that will use that intermediate layer of segments um to to render everything onto the terminal nice okay yeah it sounds like a really good separation and you could probably also if you need to do something specific for one platform versus another uh, that layer you can make a decision uh, on how to do that without that's exactly it. Yeah, yeah. Put it all over the place, right? Yeah. So, so I render onto the segments, and that's um, platform independent. Um, but there's another bit of code which will convert those segments um, onto the appropriate format of the platform. Um, and the platform might be the number of colors that's supported by terminals, because um, some will support 16.7 million colors, some will, will support 256, and then some will support 16. Yeah. Um, but because of that intermediate layer, um, I can make sure that no matter what you write, uh, we'll, we'll work on, on the terminal on the given platform. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, uh, let's see. So one of the things I do want to circle back to is this idea of you're taking a year off to continue to work on this project to grow it even further and than it yeah. already has and, and also mm -hmm. do other things in this general realm. And so there's there's a couple of ways in which people can support you, right? If you're a large bank that depends on this kind of stuff, mm -hmm. uh, one of the good options is Tidelift, right? People can get a Tidelift subscription uh, mm -hmm. for Rich, and that gives what, is, what do they get with that? Um, so I don't think you get a, a, a subscription for Rich per se, but you can get a Tidelift subscription. I see. Okay, and uh, that means that um, uh, that money is divided. Uh, amongst all the open source projects that you use that are signed up to to Tidelift. And in return, you, you get um, uh, more responsive uh, developers and uh, developers which will handle like security issues, um, et cetera. It just may, takes the risk out of um, open source yeah. code for, for big organizations because the, there is a little bit of risk in the, um, if you're relying on someone's hobby project, are they going to be around in six months to year time? Yeah. So um, Tidelift um, ensures that developers will be around uh, in the future to, to support your, your code going forward. Absolutely. The other one is right up the top here. I could click Sponsor, and yep. then I can come over here. Also, that pulls up a link to the external funding for uh, Tidelift. Mm -hmm. But I can hit Sponsor. Do you have like uh, plans or anything like that? I know some some projects have... You know, there's like a gold sponsor, and here's just a sort of keep it going sponsor. Do yeah. you have anything like that, or is it just you know what people want? Um, there is, yeah. Um, so GitHub sponsor supports tiers. Um, so depending on how much you want to sponsor, um, I, I'll I will help you with your with your projects. Um, I'm always happy to help people actually open source projects. I'm always happy to do that, but mm -hmm. um, for the um. Larger tiers, um, I will do code reviews, or I will help you with your project on a more more formal basis. I might even uh, write code for you. So it's it's up to up to you what you want to sponsor. If you just want to say thanks, that's very much appreciated. You know, if I've solved if I fixed a bug for you, and um, just want to say thanks, then that that's fantastic. But if if you're a company which is benefiting um, from the work that I do or the work that other open source developers do, uh, you can sponsor a bit more to ensure that that it keeps the, the work going. Right on. Yeah, and I encourage people, if they're depending heavily upon this, you know, help you keep going strong, especially as you're transitioning to just working on this. Mm. So, yeah, also uh, notice someone's forked it since we even pulled it up here. How cool. So the other, <laughs> the next step that maybe you would <clears throat> take this, you talked about not wanting to add too many insane features to Rich. Mm -hmm. to, to keep growing that, right? Keep it focused and on target. Is you also have this project called Textual, and Textual yep. is a TUI. We've all heard of a GUI, but a TUI mm -hmm. is a text user interface instead of a graphical user interface, right? Yeah, I think it's a bit of a um, misnomer. I mean, because the interface is constructed with text, granted, but it's still yeah. a graphical thing you're looking at. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So I, th I think of it as um, a GUI, but with kind of like a uh, fairly retro aesthetic. Yeah, um, but... <laughs> it does have a bit of a retro aesthetic. I would say maybe if you built something with like Colorama or something, that would be maybe more Tui esque, right? Where there's, where you look mm. at what you build with textual, it it's got scroll bars, it's got banners, it's got 
icons. <laughs> it's yeah, it's closer by far. Um, Looks a, a bit more, a bit more graphical. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So tell us about textual and and why not just more features on Rich. Yeah, uh, so um, Rich has some kind of dynamic features. Um, there are progress bars and they're updating um, live dashboards. And I've been asked quite quite a lot if I could add keyboard support and, and mouse support. Um, and I've resisted uh, for, for quite a while because I want to keep the, the focus of Rich onto just generating mostly static output. Mm -hmm. um, then, then I saw a project called um, GHTOP, um, which is kind of like HTOP, but it would take um, information from the, the GitHub API and it would show you like real time events. And they used, uh, oh, there we go. Yeah, and they fantastic. used Rich for that. And when I saw oh, that, okay. I realized oh, I've got to do this. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of potential there. And I put it off a little bit, but then, then I started on it. And I kind of realized that, yeah, there's, there's quite a lot you can do with the terminal. Yeah, there is. And this, this is really, this is one of the things that blew my mind. So maybe, uh, you know, give us a sense of, I'm trying to pull a particular picture. Maybe this is just one I could sort of leave on the screen. But um, one of the things I remember from my early days of, like, of GUI type development is you know, how do you resize stuff on the screen, right? So I want to put something where like the, the main window is here, but then I want the status bar thing, but I want it to stick to the bottom. Mm. And then I want some other stuff on the left. And it sounds like that would be pretty tricky to just dynamically try to generate with Rich. But with Textual, you can say like, this thing docks to the left and this docks to the bottom. Yeah. And here, this fills the main content. And then those bits in the middle, are those basically rendered either more of these these containers and these widgets or is that rich directly or you know, tell, give so, people a sense of yeah. like what they build with this. So um, Rich does the, the rendering. Uh, rich is responsible for getting stuff onto the screen, but um, Textual handles the, the dynamic stuff. Um, at the um, most at atomic layer, there's uh, something called a widget. And a widget is um, almost like a... a a software component in itself. It's yeah. built on async IO. Um, so each widget has its own uh, async IO task and it's constantly processing, processing events. And Textual can um, will change the size of that and change the layout in response to resizing the, the terminal. And you can tell it how the, ter the widgets fit together uh, within the given dimensions. Um, of right. the so you've got like the, the layout elements that that handle docking and whatnot. yeah 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 very cool so uh, uh one of the examples you have on the textual readme uh, is building one of these widgets so you just create a class it drives from widget mm -hmm. here you have a, a hover example and it has a way to render itself and then it very much like traditional, you know, I'm thinking of building like VB6 apps or Windows Forms apps, like these traditional ones where you have drag and drop widgets. Mm. They have these events, right? And one of the events here, you wouldn't think of this as a terminal thing. We've got like, you know, on mouse, <laughs> you know, on mm. enter, on leave and, you know, yeah. mouse over and, and things like that, right? Like those are regular UI types of interactions that you would not expect to see in a text-based app right yeah that's fantastic yeah. Mm. so it's, it's it's very much um it's based partially on my knowledge of um writing desktop applications which is quite old now mm. oh yeah what did you write them in um wx widgets mostly yeah um uh -huh. it's a it's a c++ framework i think it's, it's got um a python layer yeah yeah um, there's wx python i i think that might yeah. be the the next the, the python wrapper that's right yeah uh, and then but in the last 10 years i haven't done any desktop applications i've been working mostly in the web so it's mostly influenced um by web development with modern frameworks um, particularly right. Vue, which i've used yeah. a few times Vue's nice yeah Vue's use very nice yeah mm -hmm. so i'm trying to replicate some of the best features i think of Vue uh, into the terminal and i'm surprised how well some of these features translate yeah. <clears throat> yeah, this this is incredible. It it really does build these interactive uh, things. Now, another thing to talk about is, you know, 
how do you control the look and feel, right? Like the way I, the way you might do it in Rich is you might have one of these console markups or Markdown, mm-hmm. or you could use a console and set a style. But mm-hmm. if you're inspired by the web, you know, yeah. like dot main container hash thing I want to mm-hmm. style, right? Like it's some sort of CSS selector, right? Um, yeah, so you've, you've read my mind. I'm, I've been last few days working on um, CSS. And okay. It's going to work um, very much. Is like, it actual CSS or CSS like stuff? Like what are you, what do you what do you have in mind here? Um, so it's probably not actual CSS um, because a lot of, a lot of the stuff just wouldn't apply. Yeah, it doesn't make terminal. sense. Sure. Um, but essentially, it's the selectors. So um, I will have selectors um, where you can select um, an, an ID. Uh, and then a child with a with a class name, etc. Yeah, I mean that's basically what I was thinking when I was saying real CSS, right? Like, is it? Right. Will I say? Will I say like hash container dot children mm-hmm. type? And I would write that, or is it like not exactly, exactly that, but it's exactly, exactly like that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The only thing that differs um, is the um, I don't know what you call them. The bit that goes inside the curly brackets, the actual rules that they will be different. Um, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Of, yeah, they render different different things, but very much like CSS. If you come from the web, uh, you see this, you'd be very much at home. Nice. I could probably even use less and transpile that down to CSS and then put the odds. Yeah, maybe. Who knows? Yeah, maybe. I, I was thinking, should I should I just do CSS, which is hard enough in itself, or, or should I try to implement um, less or, or, or yeah. SAS or, or one of these things? And um well, I'm going to try CSS first of all. Um, if you get maybe, it working with CSS, then you probably can get the less compiler to generate the right CSS out of it somehow. Yeah, maybe. But yeah. actually, um, one of the worst things I think of JavaScript and web app development is is all those preprocessors. I know. I, I'm I'm a hundred percent with you. Yeah. When you've got to run all these tasks and all these CLI things just to get it, so you can start using your app, it's like there's something kind of broken about this. Can I just yeah, include a file here and go. Like it's, it's gotten so complicated that JavaScript is one of the more complicated ways to write code rather than one of the simplest. I think these days. Exactly. Yeah. There was there was a time um, where front end development was was seen as is kind of like um, the 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 baby brother of like real mm-hmm. development. All right. Are you you in your cute jQuery? Come on. <laughs> but, um, that's not true anymore. I don't think it's been true for a while. I think oh, um, yeah. uh, front end development. Um, requires just the same type of thinking as 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 back ends. You've got to organize all these different processes together and mental models. And it's actually more complicated because there's so much going on. There's so many little things you've got to remember. Yeah. Um, yeah. You're taking so much of like modern software development and squishing it down to this narrow little bit that is like run it in JavaScript on the browser. Right, yeah. like it's kind of got to fit into this historically what used to be like a narrow focused environment, and, mm-hmm. and now it's definitely not. Yeah, so I'm trying to take what I think are the good things about front end development and apply them mm-hmm. to the terminal, and hopefully yeah. leave out the things which um, I don't like so much. Yeah, that sounds great. Mm. So. Maybe for this one, I think what people should probably do is they should check out the examples, right? The examples from Textual. They can clone the repo and just run these, and it's super easy. There's also a way to see them, I guess, on the the developer video log here. Uh, are, yeah. are these you doing these videos here? Um, that's me, yeah. Just using yeah. Um, a short demo of uh, each. Um, nice. This is, this is my ad, me. apparently, I'm getting now. I'm, All right. Uh, we'll not play that <laughs> and go YouTube. All right. Mm-hmm. So yeah, but people can go and check these out because I think seeing it in action is really what you need to appreciate textual. Mm. And it can demonstrate the features which um, textual can do, which I don't see in other 2E frameworks. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm thinking particularly of animation. Yeah, I was just thinking um, like the CSS easing functions and those types yeah. of animations. Yeah, yeah, I, I was surprised that how well that worked. I was animating things at sixty frames a second, and it can go up to one hundred and twenty frames per second. Um, Amazing. 
Yeah, the t terminals these days that they're built on the same technology as video games. They they use um hardware accelerated graphics under the hood, so wow. they can actually render um terminal updates very very quickly. And I don't think people have taken advantage of that. How long until someone re-implements Doom on Rich or on <laughs> Dextra? <laughs> I'm sure it's Days. possible. You could yeah, yeah, you could render it and then um don't know uh, render it onto text. I don't know how you do it, but various ways of rendering images so in theory you yeah. could put doom in the middle of it i would say start with really really small fonts and a big terminal window so you get higher resolution yeah yeah <laughs> but yeah you've got the color you've got the emojis i bet you could make it happen hmm. awesome all right well we're getting pretty short on time here will anything else you want to um sort of throw in about textual or even rich before we wrap it up um, nothing comes to mind, but, um, just, just to say that, uh, I like getting feedback and input. Um, so if you have any suggestions, uh, jump onto textual discussion board or, or if you find any bugs, let me know, um, or connect with me on Twitter and I'm happy to talk about these things. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, also want to give a shout out to your other, one of your other projects real quick. Okay. Great. Yeah. So this is, um, Pathfast system. I've been working on that for well over 10 years now. Um, I've handed it over to some uh, very talented developers. <clears throat> but um, essentially, the, the idea is that there's um, uh, abstraction layer for file systems. So you, the same code can write to your, your, your disk drive um, or an FTP server or, or a zip file, and just all works exactly the same way. Nice. Do you have uh, like cloud format support, like S3 and things like that? Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So there's there's an S3 uh, version and there's a Google Cloud version and there's, there's dozens of other um, implementations. Any so database can... stuff? Can I like treat a table as a directory or something like that? Um, I wouldn't be surprised if there is. I, I don't. I don't know of any off the top of my head. But some mm -hmm. people have done some yeah. quite creative things where they've made something which is not a file system. Uh, look like a file system. Oh, look at this Dropbox FS. Dropbox yeah. as a file system. Okay. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> okay, here's the index of file systems. Let's see. We've got application data, FTP in memory. Oh, that's pretty slick. So you can read and write files, like say for tests and not care. Um, yeah, like exactly. 10 files, maybe. Temp files would be fantastic, right? Yeah. So you can use it 10 files. And like you said, for for testing, so you can write it into memory without bothering to write it onto your hard drive. Okay, the multi-file system, so you could multiplex reads and writes. That's pretty killer. Yeah, that, that's more. Um, if I remember correctly, uh, you can layer several file systems, so um, mm -hmm. you could have one to write and then several to read, and depending on where the file is, it'll just make it appear like a, a single file system. Cool. Yeah, a lot of neat stuff here. So you know, people, they got a lot of file reading and writing to do. They can check that out. Also, I want to give a quick shout out. I saw Paul Everett on the live stream out there. So Paul and you um, dove inside in a more visual way uh, into um, textual, right? So I'll link to a live stream you all did over there together. Great, cool. Yeah, that was yeah. fun. <laughs> yeah, awesome. All right. Well, I think that pretty much wraps it up. So. I'll give you the final two questions uh, before we get out of here, though. So, Will, if you're going to write some Python code, what editor do you use these days? Um, I use VS Code. I've used that for quite a while. Um, I'm quite happy with it, but um, I do try other editors from time to time. Nice. And then, in addition to pip install rich and pip install textual, any other um, packages out there you want to give a shout out to that you think could use some? Eyeballs and some attention. Um, Anything that's impressed you lately? Uh, I'm drawing a blank. There's, there's so many. Um, it, it is hard to choose, isn't it? <laughs> uh, there's a project I saw. Can I can I mention one that uses Rich? It was quite. Cool. Of course, yeah, um, absolutely. It's called um, Object Explorer. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, it's a, a terminal user interface, but it's not. I think it's OBJ Explorer. Which is quite oh. nice. Um, you could create an op you explore a Python object and you can navigate into it in a, in a visual way, and it will show you the um, 
the attributes, etc. cetera. Uh, oh, fantastic. Yeah, that sounds really fun. Is, is this yeah. for like in-memory Python objects or database objects or what? what is it? Oh, in-memory Python objects. So I think it's like oh. a, a debugging tool. It's, it's kind of like, it's a bit like rich.inspect, um, but right. it's more right. visual. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, fantastic. We'll have to link to that one. All right, Will. So thank you for being here. This has been really great. Congratulations on both of these projects and all the momentum you've gotten. Final call to action. People want to check out Richer Textual, maybe want to support you, um, whatever else you want to give a final shout out for or call to action before we call it a show. Um, just um, connect, me, though. connect with me on Twitter. Uh, my handle is at Will McGugan say hi i'm happy to uh talk on twitter all right right on be sure to put the link in the show notes thanks for being here will thank you it's been great yeah bye, bye, -bye. thanks everyone for being here at the live stream as well